Hello everyone and welcome to Scream Stream, where every week I scour the web to separate the best from the worst of streaming horror, so you don't have to. I'm James Gass. If you're new to the show, what I do is pick a horror film from one of the various streaming services and give it a spoiler-free review, and lets you know if it's worth watching. There's a lot of good horror films out there, so my goal is to make sure you're spending your time watching the good ones. If you'd like to keep up with me outside of the podcast, you can do so at ScreamPod.com, where you can find links to all of my social profiles, subscribe to the podcast via your favorite podcatcher, and get the show notes for each episode. You can also drop me a line with comments and suggestions to ScreamStreamCast at gmail.com. ScreamStream is listener-supported, and you can support the podcast three different ways. The first is directly through Patreon over at patreon.com slash ScreamStream. If you sign up for one of our monthly donations, you'll get extra perks and extra content uh, each and every month. Or you can go to any of the show notes pages. For example, this one will be at screenpod.com slash podcast slash five. Scroll down to where you see my Amazon Horror Picks of the Week. And what I'll do is have my Horror Picks of the Week related to uh, the current episode. And normally what I do is I pick some DVDs or some some other sort of horror-related item. Or you can use a search bar and search for whatever you want and buy something through my affiliate link. Uh, I get a little kickback from that at no cost to you. And then finally... One of the easiest ways to support the show is to share the podcast with horror fanatics in your life and help grow the Scream Stream community. So, on to the show. This week is the episode right before Halloween, and I know for many of us horror fanatics, Halloween is like our favorite holiday. Uh, This is the time where we get to dress up, or we watch, uh, or we make an excuse to watch horror movies all day long. Uh, Some of us take off work. Not me, but I know some of us do. And when I was trying to come up with a Halloween theme for a show that's already about horror, it's a little difficult. So what I decided to do was talk about uh, the classic universal horror films. These are the films that sort of birthed the horror genre in cinema. I know there, there were several films before Uh, Universal did their horror films. I mean, you had Nosferatu, you had The uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and several others. But I think the Universal horror films were those that really launched horror into the mainstream. Uh, Before these films were made, Universal was actually, uh, I think, $2.2 million in the hole. They made Dracula in 1931, well, I think it was made in in uh, late 1930, and it was released on February the 14th, Valentine's Day on 1931, and made them a lot of money. Uh, and after that, they, uh, I think the same year they did uh, Frankenstein, and then in 19, the next year they did The Mummy, and uh, in 1933 they did The Invisible Man, and then in 1941 they did uh, The Wolfman. And these are the classic, iconic uh, figures of horror. So I'm going to assume that you have already seen these films because they're so old. Uh, Normally I do spoiler-free reviews, but this time we're going to talk about uh, these films uh, individually and and collectively. And I want to start off with Dracula. Uh, Now... I have to be completely honest, I have not actually watched any of these films until uh, this past week, Uh, and I really wish I had watched them sooner, and if you are someone who is just getting into horror, these are the films where you need to start with. Uh, Go back and watch these movies, especially if you're younger, things will sort of make a lot more sense when you watch uh, more modern horror films, you'll you'll see a lot of the tropes and where the tropes came from. Uh, you'll see a lot of references to these films that are actually inaccurate, and I'll explain that a little later. So let's get back to Dracula here, though. A few interesting things about, about this film. Uh, there is actually no soundtrack, which I thought was a little weird. And uh, come to find out, 
because of the technical limitations, they didn't have a soundtrack. But what they did was in the opening credits, and I knew this sounded familiar, and I had to go back and look it up. Uh, the opening credits, they used the music for Swan Lake. I believe it was like the, it was an, it was an excerpt from Act Two of uh, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. And I recognized music. I was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. And they did the same thing for The Mummy, too. But during the film, there was there was no score. And the film was directed by Todd Browning and was uh, based on the book by Bram Stoker and was adapted by Hamilton uh, Dene. And it starred Bela Lugosi, Helen Chandler, and David Manners. Those are the top three built uh, casts. And also starred Dwight Fry as Renfield, who uh, passed away fairly early in his life not long after shooting uh, Frankenstein. And it also started Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing. And of course, for the brief plot synopsis, an ancient vampire, Count Dracula, arrives in England and begins to prey upon the virtuous young Mina. So, Bela Lugosi did a great job as, as Dracula. Very brooding. And you'll notice that uh, in a lot of films... And I think it might have started with this film, but to get that sort of devious look, what they did was they lit up his eyes or the area around his eyes and darkened the rest of them. And you sort of see that technique all the way up through like the late seventies, even into to the hammer horror series where uh, Christopher Lee played Dracula uh, in, in several of those films. And I have to say the film actually, holds up over time. Now, these are all exclusively uh, available for streaming on Shudder. And the I guess they cleaned up these films because they looked really good. Uh, the acting in these films, it's, they have that classic cinema acting that you just don't see anymore, where every like syllable is articulated. Uh, and the way they move the way they speak to each other, the way they interact, the body language they use, it's all very, this this classic cinema style that I wish uh, could make a comeback because it, it's, there's something extremely eloquent about the way they acted uh, back then. And as far as the story goes, it's actually a really short film and the story is just very straight to the point. We start off with, uh, we see Dracula, and we see that um, we actually get to see Renfield as a as a normal guy with all of his marvels before Dracula turns him into this weird slave kind of person. And it's funny because in this film, he is actually the real estate person uh, selling uh, the Abbey to Dracula. Uh, and then Dracula travels to London. And that is where he sees Ms. Mina. Um, then we see Renfield sort of turn into this crazy, weird slave guy. And all the, the, the things happen, the main key points from the book happen. But one interesting thing that I noticed was that we never saw any fangs. Dracula never showed his fangs in the film. Everything was sort of um, alluded to. And uh, I guess they they left that up to the viewer's imagination. I don't know if it was that or if it was censor, 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 censorship. I can't talk tonight. The reason why they didn't show that, I, where they showed Jack Dracula's death at the end, that was also done off camera, and all you could do was hear him scream. Um, as for my overall thoughts on the film, this film is actually really good. It still holds up. Uh, after all these years, uh, I think it's still, it, it, of course, it's it's not scary, but it is still really good to watch. It was a really fun movie to watch. It don't, wasn't, uh, you didn't, how can I, how can I explain this? You know, with cinema now, we have so many different special effects and visual effects with CGI. Um, nothing in this film looked cheesy. And in some of the, well, okay, when Dracula turns into the bat, yeah, sure, that that's a little goofy. But it's not something that you think, oh, wow, that looks really bad. It's 
it's just part of the film and, and you don't really think about it that much. You store, you sort of just kind of go along with it and expect it to look cheesy because it is 1931, but everything was still really well done. Uh, I highly recommend this film. If you haven't seen it, please go and watch it. Don't be like me and wait until midlife to, to watch this film. Cause if you are a horror fanatic, you should be watching it. So the next uh, few films I'm going to talk about collectively, uh, because to go through all these individually would take a, a lot amount of a lot of time. I don't think you want to sit through another four reviews. Uh, let's move on to Frankenstein. Again, a classic film. This one was directed by James Whale. And came out on uh, the 21st of November of, of 1931. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, Victor Frankenstein's name was changed to Henry, uh, played by Colin Clive. I thought that was interesting, and I found out that the film was actually based off the play, and the play changed a couple of the characters' names. Also, uh, something interesting to note was that uh, the credit was given to Mrs. Percy B. Shelley rather than Mary Shelley in the opening credits, and I assume that's because women's, right, women's rights didn't really exist back then, um, and you know, societal stuff. Uh, they didn't list Mary Shelley. They list her husband, just Mrs. Percy B. Shelley. But again, they, they cleaned this film up extremely well. Uh, there was a score, I believe. I remember hearing a score. And a lot of really cool effects on this. And while I was watching it, I thought, you know, how did they do this in 1931? It's It's amazing. Um, the technology that they had or the the ways they figured out how to do some of this stuff was was great. Uh, and of course, I think this is the film that launched Boris Karloff's career uh, in the horror genre. Uh, so overall, this film was actually really good. Uh, all of the acting was great and the story was very straight to the point. It was a very short film. I think it was like maybe an hour and 10 minutes, something like that. Uh, but I thought they also had like some really nice comic relief in there. Uh, and I wonder, you know, is that, is this where some of that started? Um, where in a horror film, you kind of have some comedy to kind of relax you a little bit and get you ready for the next sort of scare. Uh, and again, you know, this movie wasn't scary, but it is really good. And it, and it creates a, or it presents a, a moral dilemma, you know, do you root for the monster or do you think that it needs to die because it's an abomination? Just a really interesting story altogether. Uh, if you haven't seen this one, please see it. Now with The Mummy, this one was all, this one was directed by Carl, Carl Frund, uh, and this, I, I, you know, I thought this was also based on a book, but it was not. It was written by Nina Wilcox Putnam, and Richard Scheer, and apparently they've written a lot of films, um, and they've written a lot of books, and K Boris Karloff is back as uh, the mummy, uh, whose name was Imhotep, and I, I went into this movie thinking that uh, he was going to be wrapped up like a mummy the entire film, I assumed that The Mummy with Brandon Fraser was just a completely different take on The Mummy altogether. And boy, was I wrong. He was wrapped up like a mummy for maybe five, the first five minutes of the film. And as soon as that happened, as soon as uh, we got flashback forward to like 10 years, yeah, 10 years from the time that he was risen he looked like a human, most mostly like a human. But, you know, I, and from that moment on, I kept thinking, I kept making comparisons between this film and The Mummy with Brandon Fraser and thought, wow, it, I just assumed that he was like a mummy the entire time who walked around in bandages, holding his arms out, going, uh, and, and yeah, I had, I had no idea that, it was something completely different. Uh, so let me give you a synopsis on this film. 
1921, a field expedition in Egypt discovers the mummy of an ancient Egyptian prince, Imhotep, who was condemned and buried alive for sacrilege. Also found in the tomb was a scroll of Toth, uh, which can bring the dead back to life. One night, a young member of the expedition reads the scroll aloud and then goes insane, realizing that he has brought Imhotep back to life. Ten years later, disguised as a modern Egyptian, the mummy attempts to reunite with his lost love, an ancient princess who has been reincarnated into a beautiful young woman. And it follows that story, and I, I don't know how else to explain this, that I was just so surprised that this is what it was. And, and extremely well made, well acted. Uh, there are some genuine scary moments in this film. The acting was great. Boris Karloff finally had like a like a real speaking part, um, and I thought he did a great job with this. The cleanup was great. Uh, the story was awesome, and again, it it really stands the test of time. You know, I watched a lot of a lot of uh, Twilight Zone, and when I look at the time period and the way people dressed. This didn't look much different from that. So I guess that's why, to me, it seemed more modern than 1930, 32. Yeah, great film. I enjoyed this one a lot. And then The Invisible Man, I think this is like my favorite of the classics. Uh, this one was also directed by James Whale, uh, who did Frankenstein, uh, based upon the novel by H.G. Wells. Uh, and this one stars... Claude Rains as uh, the Invisible Man, Gloria Stewart, William, William Harrigan, Henry Travers, Una O'Connor, uh, Forrester Harvey, Holmes Herbert, E. e. Clive, uh, and several others. This film was, I think this was probably the scariest of the films because you see what happens to this, this normal guy when he becomes invisible, he turns insane. And to think of what someone who is invisible can actually do, the damage they can do, uh, is terrifying. And the effects they use on this film were amazing. Like, I, I just kept wondering, how did they do this in 1933? How did they make this happen? Uh, and you can tell where, uh, where they have like some of the where like he's wearing his his pajamas, but his head is invisible and his hands are invisible, and all you do is see the pajamas moving around. I kind of wonder how they did that. You can see sort of uh, artifacts in the effects, but still they were really good for 1933. Uh, again, extremely well acted. Claude Rains was amazing in this film. You could really tell that he had a lot of fun with the character. This one currently has a 7.7 on IMDb, and it is the second highest rated classic film. Uh, Frankenstein comes in first at 7.9, and then uh, The Invisible Man has a 7.7. Uh, extremely well made, uh, great acting, great story. I think this one is probably my favorite. Um, again, these are all on Shutter, so you should go and check those out. And then The Wolfman, um, probably my least favorite, just because I don't, I don't know. It, it, the story was good. It just wasn't. I guess it wasn't as scary as I wanted it to be, or it wasn't. Um, I don't know. I, I think they could have done some other stuff with this. They could have done a lot more, I think. Um, and again, this one was really short, but they did clean it up. It looked really good. The acting was great. Lon Chaney Jr., who did a lot of horror genre films, uh, was great in this. Uh, Bella Lugosi made uh, an appearance as a gypsy. Uh, he w uh, Sadly, he wasn't in the very movie very long. But he did do a great job as, as his gypsy character this one was directed by george wagner uh, who also directed the phantom stage uh, horror island and then he directed a lot of westerns 
Uh, so he didn't really do like a whole lot of horror, but he did a, f- a few of them. And I think this is probably like his most famous film. But yeah, I, I thought this one was good. I just didn't think it was as good as the rest of them. If I had to rate all these, I'd say The Invisible Man is my top. Dracula is number two. Uh, I think The Mummy would be number three. Frankenstein would be four. And then um, Wolfman was coming in at last. But they're still all really good. And you should really check them out. So there you go. There's my kind of rundown of the Universal Horror Monsters. Again, if you haven't seen these movies, you got to watch them. They are really good. Quick watches, you know, they each come in at just a little over an hour um, for a runtime. And if it wasn't for these films, who knows where the horror genre would be? Universal might not have even stuck around very much longer after that. Uh, You know, they were in the hole and the horror genre saved them. So there you go. So the next time somebody somebody tells you horror is stupid, just let them know, hey, we wouldn't have Universal if it wasn't for horror. All right, so moving on to news. I don't really have news, but I did have I did find something really interesting uh, this week digging around through um, through the various websites. And Slash Film did a lease a list of eleven horror movies that actually take place on Halloween. You know, on Halloween. We watch horror films, but we're always kind of looking for films that take place right around Halloween or or even on Halloween, Um, and some of them we just don't really think about that much. Well, here are 11 films that actually take place on Halloween. Uh, Starting off the list is Halloween from 1978, uh, John Carpenter's infamous classic, and then also Halloween 3. Season of the Witch, which I think is actually a really good film. I know it gets a lot of hate because it had nothing to do with with Michael Myers. Uh, But I think this is an excellent film on its own. And, you know, the reason why they did this film uh, was because uh, John Carpenter had this vision of doing a series of films, kind of like an anthology TV show, but he was going to do an anthology of films based on Halloween or that take place on Halloween, um, all within the same sort of universe. But I guess people just didn't like that. So it gets a lot of hate, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, Ginger Snaps. I forgot, completely forgot about this film. This was actually a really good movie. Uh, And it came out in 2000. It's about a girl who gets bitten by a werewolf. A really good film. Uh, Trick or Treat. Uh, which is one of my favorites. This came out in 2007. This is Trick or Treat. There was another film called Trick or Treat that came out in the 80s. I never actually got around to watching that, but I did want to see it. Uh, May, which was uh, done by Lucky McGee. Really, really good film. This came out in 2002. A young woman traumatized by a difficult childhood goes to extreme lengths to connect with other people. Night of the Demons takes place on Halloween. Uh, this film came out in 1988. This is kind of one of those classic campy horror films that you should probably watch if you haven't seen it. For a basic plot, uh, 10 teenagers throwing a Halloween party at an abandoned funeral home accidentally awakening an evil force. Good campy fun, really, to be honest. Uh, the Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane. This, is, this came out in 1976. And stars Jodie Foster, a very young Jodie Foster. I haven't seen this one. This one has been in my queue for a very long time. But I never got uh, around to watching it. Uh, I think maybe I finally will do that. Uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, Rob Zombie's 2003 art house film. Uh, I guess it was a hit. I liked it. I thought it was great. A lot of people didn't. Uh, the Guest. This was supposed to be really good. This has been in my queue for a while. This is a film by Ty West, and he's kind of hit, hit or miss for me. I think this was Ty West. No, I'm sorry, it's Adam Wingard, uh, who had a, a couple segments in VHS. Another hit or miss for me. But uh, Adam Wingard also did Your Next, which was a really good film. But yeah, The Guest is supposedly really good. We need to talk about Kevin uh, from 2011. I didn't really like this film all that much. It was okay. It wasn't my favorite. 
uh, and uh, as I mentioned, VHS 2012. This is, is a found footage film, um, but kind of has like an overarching story that connects each of the small segments. This is actually a really good movie. I actually enjoyed the various sequels. We had VHS, uh, SVHS, uh, VHS Viral. I think there was three or four of them. Um, but these are all really good movies. And uh, one, of them, one of these segments, the final segment, uh, does take place on Halloween. Really good movie. So if you haven't seen the VHS films, I do highly recommend those. I believe they are on Netflix. And then speaking of Netflix... Let's move on to what's new to stream. There's two things on Netflix this week. The Mist Season 1. Now, I heard this is really bad. I don't know if I'm going to watch it. I might watch an episode. I don't know. I've just heard really bad things about it. Uh, it's been canceled. Um, so there you go. Uh, you watch it. Let me know what you thought. And then finally, Stranger Things Season 2. I just finished this tonight. Man, what a great show. Uh, I was... The, the way this season ended was just great. I'm so excited for the next season. Uh, this is probably like next to The Twilight Zone. This is probably my number two favorite show of all time. Man, it's just a really great show. Well produced. I just wish there were more episodes. Uh, but on Shudder, uh, we have a lot of new stuff. Spookers, which is a documentary about people who do uh, haunted houses professionally. Uh, found footage 3D, the 3D version. I did watch this movie. I liked it. Uh, I will do a review of it uh, later on down the road. But the 3D version is out. Uh, the Core, which is a new variety show, exclusively on Shutter, kind of like a talk show, but focused on horror. Uh, can't take it back. I don't know if I'm gonna watch this. It doesn't look all that great. Uh, the Corpse of Vanna Fritz, uh, Lace Crater, which is looks like a horror comedy and Dark Valley. And then on Prime, I don't know if these are new, but they definitely are worth mentioning, and I saw them come up in like the newly released or whatever. Uh, first up, we have Audrey Rose from 1977. Uh, then we have Motel Hell from the 80s. Uh, great movie. Uh, one of my favorites. I actually have, they did a comic book adaptation a couple years ago, and I have those comic books. The Town That Dreaded Sundown, the 2014 film, I actually did a review of this movie on the original Scream Stream podcast, which is not currently online, but I will have it up sooner or later. Uh, I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, the Legend of Boggy Creek from 1972. Uh, this is sort of like a mockumentary film about Bigfoot. Uh, and then Tourist Trap, which was a, another excellent film uh, from the 80s. And then the Blair Witch film from 2016. Now, this film got a lot of hate, and I thought it was okay. I wouldn't like go out and say, hey, you got to seek this movie out. I, I paid the three bucks to rent it. I don't think it was really worth the money to rent, uh, to be honest with you. It just wasn't that great of a film. I'd probably skip it. Um, so there you go. There are the newest streaming horror films, uh, at least that I could find. So next week, I think uh, I think actually what I will do is review uh, Found Footage 3D. Uh, there are two different versions up there on Shutter. There's a 3D version that's like the blue and red thing uh, for those of us who don't have you know fancy 3D TVs, and they also have the version, the 3D version for those of you who do have fancy 3D TVs. Um, so I'll probably be watching that in 3D. I got some 3D glasses that I got from uh, um, Friday the 13th 3D somewhere around here. Um, so I'm going to be watching that and review that next week. So that's going to wrap up my Halloween edition of Scream Stream. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you continue to listen. And remember, Scream Stream is listener support. You can support the show over at patreon.com slash screamstream. I do want you to know how important your support is, whether it's financial support through Patreon or just sharing it out with your friends and your family. Uh, you encourage me to keep this show going, and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, if you have a movie you'd like me to review, send me your suggestion to screamstreamcast at gmail.com, or you can go over to screampod.com slash contact. Uh, and while you're there, remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, and TuneIn Radio. I have little buttons for all those. 
uh, right there on the website. Music used for Scream Stream was created by Kevin McLeod over at incompotech.com. And until next week, I'm James Gass saying, if it was real, the cameraman would be dead too. Good night. Good night.